Uh, Martha Lane Fox is our next guest. She is a British businesswoman and entrepreneur and member of the House of Lords. In 1998, during the dot-com bubble, she founded the website lastminute.com, a travel and gift business. The website survived the bubble and was sold for 577 million pounds in 2005 to Sabre Holdings. She later went on to chair Go On UK, which runs the website dot everyone uh, dot org dot UK. In 2006, she was severely, uh, 2004, she was severely injured in a car accident, and she says that she's now partly metal and uses the accident as inspiration for how technology can help people. She serves on the board of Twitter, and in 2013, she became the youngest woman ever to join the British House of Lords. As executive chair of Dot Everyone, Fox focuses on how digital technology is changing society and how it can be better and partners with organizations to deliver change. Ladies and gentlemen, Martha Lane Fox. Hi. Hello. Great nice, to see you. Nice to meet you. Thank Hi. you. Thank you for uh, joining us. As you can see, we have a remarkably engaged uh, audience, but it, you know, we'll talk a little bit and then we'll, we'll get to them. Uh, I would ask you to address uh, something that's come up this weekend, uh, th this last couple of days. Um, it's about, and it's, it's an issue you know about and you and I talked about a little bit, it, a gender imbalance in, in technology, in particular in engineering, but a, a gender imbalance in, in technology. What have you seen evolve? Uh, what still has to be overcome and why? It's very surprising to me that the industry that did not exist 30 years ago. Is that me making a noise? Maybe it's my Oh, it's ear. earring. OK. I, well, we can, we can either adjust the mic. OK, well, there you go. <laughs> problem solved. Um, easy piece. She is a problem solver. There we go. Um, you know, the promise of the internet to me when I was 25 and we were starting uh, lastminute.com back in the dawn of time was that suddenly this technology was going to enable new voices to emerge, different businesses to be created, different people to have access to the technology to empower their lives in a new way. That was what is, was exciting partly to me. So it's somewhat surprising that in a sector that did not exist 30 years ago, we have replicated the old hierarchies so fast and so quickly. And I just don't think that's OK. You know, by any metric, you look at the numbers of women in you know, digital technologies, the internet-based technologies, but, um, you know, engineering more broadly, not my expertise particularly. And it's pretty frightening. I am a member of the UK House of Lords, not the most forward-thinking organization in the world. I don't know how many people here know it, 500 years old plus. But there are more women as a percentage in our institution than there are working in internet-based technologies. And this is really quite extraordinary. You know, if you look at the management of internet organizations, it's about 16% women. But if you look at the engineers, if you look at the people building the code, it is about 4%. So 96% of the internet-enabled world is built by men. And I find that very disappointing because there was the opportunity to have a diverse set of voices, empower with, frankly, the fuel of money and resources that go to internet businesses to a more diverse group of people, a more inclusive group of people. What is the, we know that we are admitting uh, equal or higher numbers of women to university undergraduate programs in most developed nations, so we know we're graduating them. But, but we, maybe not in some of the... Correct. As you, as you go into sciences, it's not as much, and as you yeah. go into engineering, yeah. it's not as much. So where's the problem? I mean, it's probably multiple places, but mm -hmm. obviously we have to start with, with STEM programs uh, for younger girls. We have to deal with it in, in, at the high school level. We need to deal with it at the university level, and then at the employment level, and the financing of companies level, all of which you hit. Yeah, it's easy. <laughs> easy. Um, yeah, you have to do it through the whole chain. And I would argue as well, it's not about thinking in too many boxes about what an engineer or a person who might work in technology might look like. I mean, look at me. I don't necessarily look like your average, well, maybe a bit more of somebody that might start a, work in a tech company. But I think it's really important that we give women particularly lots of different ways of being involved in the digital world. And that starts with school, and it goes right through, as you say, to retention in companies and recruitment in companies. You know, we did some work with my organization, Dot Everyone, something very, very simple about job adverts. And if you write a spec for a job ad, 
uh, that looks like you are just listing all the credentials that you need as a software engineer, or as a program, whatever the different um, specificity might be, then the number of women that apply is very, very small. But if you write it around the challenge of the problem that you're solving, then you get a dramatically different number of women applying. So I think we just really need to go into the micro detail, breaking down all of the different points right. in the chain. So there have been a couple of views as to why we want to fix this problem. <laughs> uh, uh, one view expressed by somebody in the audience, uh, an engineer, said that uh, people don't aspire to be things that they can't see or don't, yep. or don't see themselves don't, in. Don't see. Another view is that women bring a different perspective to uh, technology and science and engineering. Another view is that it's just the right thing to do. Mm -hmm. The view of the Canadian Prime Minister is it's 2017. Um, what, what, I would which, really love to meet him, just by yeah, the way. Yeah, I know. If anybody's got an intro, him. he would be somebody I would like to meet. Um, um, what, what are, are those all? Yeah, I mean, it's moral, social, and economic to me. It, economic, because anybody that started a business in whatever field or any kind of organization, a charity through to a social enterprise through to a business, knows that now you have to have a digital technical component to that business. Like it or not, you might be building a website, you might be delivering a service. And the people that can do that for you are the people who feel as though they're holding the future of your organization in their hands. And if they're always men, and they're always the most highly paid, that's just wrong. It doesn't enable women to become part of our economic future. So I would say there's an economic case, there's a moral case as well, because we've worked hard to be a more equal society in many countries over the last two, three hundred years. And if we're going backwards, because of the new world, that just seems all completely wrong. We, we've had larger conversations, in fact, you just heard one, where, uh, particularly with this audience, questions of ethics and morality yes. come into play a great deal. And, and you have said that the uh, internet must be moral. Mm. Now, that might come into conflict with some people who say the internet should be everything and all things. Yeah. What do you mean when you say it must be moral? I mean two things. I think um, it's partly the discussion we've just had. I think we must, because some of these uh, technologies are invisible to most of us. You know, you go into a store and you see perhaps you get a sense of the kinds of products that it's selling. Does it look like these are products that have had small children attached to factory lines and making them? Does it look as though the people working here all come from a particular socioeconomic group and aren't being paid any money? You can see some of the problems. In the virtual world, it's much harder to get a sense of what a company looks and feels like. Mm -hmm. And I think, therefore, it, then, as consumers and users, you sometimes feel at a bit of a loss to understand the working practices of that organization through to the, the moral basis that kind of it's built on. So I think that's very important. But I also think it's because we are now facing what I think of as the kind of teenage years of the internet. You know, for someone that's worked in it since it sort of hit the mainstream in Europe, uh, particularly through e-commerce, obviously, I'm interested in now that we're beginning to think, oh my God, what have we unleashed on the world? You know, I'm on the board of Twitter, as you said, and Ev Williams, who's one of the co-founders, you may have read about this, said recently, you know, I'm really not clear that we've done completely the right thing with some of these technologies. Tony Fidel, who started Nest, you know, very successful uh, internet-based startup, said the same thing. It's like, I'm not sure I understood what I was unleashing on the world. And these are big, important moral questions, and I think we should be making sure that the leaders of these businesses are thinking about the ethics of them, but also, as we move to a different phase of the impact of technology in our lives, that our regulators, our legislators, our politicians are equipped to ask these questions and embed them right in any future legislation. I want to, I know we're gonna have a lot of questions in here. I just wanna let you guys know, in fact, I'm gonna, if you'll excuse me for a second, I'm just gonna go give this app back uh, here so that they can activate <laughs> I'll it just for riff. me. So because I think people are asking questions and I can't access them. Well, maybe no one's asking questions. I'll just have you uh, set that up for me, please. <laughs> I am the wrong guy to be moderating this session. I can't get the iPad to work. Um, <laughs> I, I will say, if you're standing outside the building, uh, I, I noticed this yesterday as I was standing at the opposite corner as everybody was out milling about. Um, in terms of, people must be wondering what's going on in that auditorium <laughs> because it's all ages yep. and shapes and colors and, and genders and I'm not sure if you said this was a, uh, a summit on engineering that that would be how yes. people would think about it and yet this is exactly what it is. It's a summit about engineering and these are the engineers. Um, I, I, I want to ask you about the, uh, it's a little bit of a continuation to what we just talked about, but the net neutrality debate that's going on. Um, who built the internet? 
should the fact that people who pay for the internet or have paid for some of the development of the infrastructure have some protection that they can get a return on their investment, or is the internet like the air, uh, which we should also protect? But um, is it is it free for us all to consume? Which we should also protect. Yes. I mean, I think there are some parallels on that. I mean, I feel very strongly that we must preserve net neutrality. I think it's to the benefit of users and consumers. I think this is one of the um, things that we have to make sure that we are trying to um, move forward with the massive advancement in how the Internet of Things will embed in our lives, how machine learning will be embedded in our lives. If we don't have some core values at the heart of these things, then I think we're going to make much worse decisions. So net neutrality is a slightly different debate in the European markets, as you probably know. We don't have the same questions around it as you're facing here in the US. But I, for one, would argue very strongly that we need to preserve net neutrality. It works for users, it works for consumers, and those are the people we should start with. So sometimes in America, it's not really as black and white as it seems, but yeah. the world might see that we have conversations on free speech that seem very absolute. Either it is or yeah. it isn't. It is also more nuanced than the world sees, but we do tend to take that black and white view, view of things here more than you would in the UK. Yeah. Is net neutrality an absolute, or are there some carve-outs and exceptions uh, that can be made? Because when you have a phone in, in America or you have an internet service, at the moment, there are some carve-outs. There are th some things I can get on this phone yeah. faster and better and don't eat up my, uh, my data time and other things that do. Yeah. But I think it's to me about where you put the reg regulation and the legislation, where you start and what your default is. And to me, the default should be about open, free, accessible to all, inclusive for all. And I believe as strongly that we should be striving to make sure everyone has the capacity to use this empowering technology as we should be to preserving it as free and open. And then I think you make the carve-outs. You don't start from the position of what are the carve-outs and how can we protect the commerciality. Right. I think you start from the other end of the spectrum. Got it. And I want to ask you something that's rele relevant to the last conversation we had about uh, invasive implants and things like that. You've, you've mentioned you're partially metal. You come from a world. <laughs> I wish I was don't. much more cleverly engineered. Well, I, but I want to get your thoughts on this because you've got parts in you. Yep. And, and we're having a conversation about where, uh, in your case, fortunately, it's not as complicated, but it's complicated. I mean, what are the ethics? Well, how do you approach the ethics about becoming a, a, a better or more complete uh, physiology and, 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 uh, and brain uh, through technology? Yeah, I mean, I feel kind of conflicted in that, on the one hand, I feel excited by these possibilities. You know, seeing who would not be moved by the man with Parkinson's or the lady moving the cup, those are profound, massive leaps for humankind, and we should not stop them. At the same time, you know, we heard about a human brain transplant. I don't know about the details of that experiment, but clearly, this is huge spectrum of activity. For me personally, I think that it's sort of inevitable that we're going to have more and more complex technology embedded in us because we're already having it. And if it was me now having the accident that I had 13, 14 years ago and I could have more things enabled in me because of technology, I would go for it completely. Mm. So I think with the right legislative and regulative regulatory frameworks and with the right ethics embedded in these things, it's an exciting future. You know, I believe that we're going to be able to make massive inroads into the challenges that human beings face. And that's why it's so great to see so many young people in this audience, because my perception is that, you know, from the world I see, it's still, you know, gender balance is surprising. It's also surprising that the internet is effectively owned by five companies in the world. You know, Microsoft, Google, Facebook, Amazon, um, that is an extremely strange position. And I think we need young people to take control of these technologies, to invent amazing new solutions to the problems that we face using them. And that's why I would really encourage everyone in this audience to feel like they can participate and address some of the big uh, things that we are going to have to think about as humans, whether it's climate change, mass movement of peoples, you know, extreme disconnects between people living in real poverty versus us in the developed world. So we all interact with those companies that own the internet every day. We wouldn't want them to go away. Um, and only, I think, in the very recent future have we started to think about the, the dangers of that sort of concentration of control. And that doesn't necessarily mean that um, I, I, I don't know what I want Facebook to do or Amazon to do or Microsoft to do differently. 
I, I am worried about the degree to which they are concentrated and control so much of the, the, the decision that I, our, our last guest who sat in that chair said, we think we're full of free will, but actually we're not that free. No. Talk to me a little about this and from your perspective, because you happen to be on the board of one of the biggest companies around. Yeah. You're on the board of Twitter. Although I think they wish they were significantly bigger. Um, I know 350 million users is a lot, but it's, we're not talking Facebook stuff, certainly not Facebook revenues. Um, you know, my view is that uh, there's two things, I guess. Firstly, it feels as though some shift in power is inevitable. You know, there is going to be legislative frameworks put around the internet. You know, in the UK, um, we have our Prime Minister talking about creating a charter for digital companies to sign up to. You know, whether you look at it from the angle of, you know, got Chinese members of the audience that would be very interested to hear their views on some of this stuff, because clearly that's a whole different framework again. But I, I don't believe Google will exist in its current form in another five, ten years' time. It feels as though that just is unsustainable. Sustainable. It's not because Google is full of bad people. It's not because there's evil at the heart of the, the empire. Not at all. I would say quite the opposite. There are amazing people trying to do good things for the planet. But those platform businesses grew so fast. When we started lastminute.com, there were none of these businesses. And now look at them. They dominate the web. So it feels inevitable that something will shift and change. Um, but secondarily, and I think this is beholden on all of us, especially those of us that remember pre these businesses, I feel alarmed when I talk to people either from different countries or young people in our, my own country when they say, but Facebook is the internet. I'm like, Facebook is not the internet. Facebook is an element and it is a phenomenal service and it provides lots of useful things to its users, but it is not the internet. And I think we need to have much more um, clear uh, understanding and education about the potential of these technologies and the, you know, the incredible range of things that you can find. How many people even know of the existence of DuckDuckGoGo, a search engine that doesn't collect your data, that uses it in a completely different way to Google? Obviously much less effective in some ways because it hasn't got that bank up of data, but if we all used it, the dynamics would change. So I do think that we as users and as citizens and as parents and as active uh, members of society, we can shift some of this balance. All right, I want to start inviting people uh, up to the uh, microphones and uh, to get the catch boxes. And I see that you're already putting uh, stuff into the, uh, into the app. Which they've done a great job of putting well done, it into brilliant. the monitors here for me so That's I can cool. see it there. Um, let me ask you this. Uh, you just mentioned the good things that have come, the, the, some, the, the good people involved in this. Yep. We certainly have, in the last year or so, become acutely aware of the dangers of social media on a mass level. Uh, the fake news, the manipulation that takes place. Yeah. Uh, give me your quick evaluation of uh, the road that's going down, the response of the internet companies, the response of regulators and yeah. government media to all of this. Yeah, I mean, I think that firstly, as they would say themselves, these big platform businesses have been caught unawares. You know, it was a surprise how quickly the phenomenon of fake, fake news spread. And I don't think that the companies uh, necessarily prioritized them fast enough, or but knew what to do about it. I think sometimes when you don't work in technology, and people here will appreciate this, it feels as though there must be a quick technical solution. And actually, some of these things are immensely complicated. To give you a sense of it from Twitter's perspective, you know, if we have an algorithm that we've built that is 90% effective in taking out abusive or fake, um, what we perceive as fake news tweets, 90% effective, so pretty good, you'd have thought. Every day, we might take down 50 million of the wrong tweets. So this is very hard science and very new technology. And so I believe that it will get better and we will get more refined at assessing it and working it. But I do think that platforms need to take more responsibility. You know, if I hear Facebook say one more time that they're just a publishing platform, no, you're right. not. You've got to... No, nobody really buys that no. part. And I don't think they do either yeah, anymore. Yeah, but yeah. It's, it's, you know, you have to step up and believe that you have had a profound role in the world. I was at a conference last week about social media and political manipulation. And guess what? Most political manipulation comes comes from governments themselves, either authoritarian regimes using it because they've manually employed thousands of citizens to spout out messages, or democratic regimes where the political parties are right. spouting out messages. So, But it seems so democratic because it's on social media. Well, it's just a tweet. Exactly. But all we right. all know that well, I, you in this country know the danger of that. An homage to tech. Uh, <laughs> very good. Yep. Are you listening over there? Can you uh, hear us? Everybody's <laughs> listening to everything. Um, let's go to the catch box first. Where have we got a catch box? Right over there. I can't see you. Oh, there. Hi. 
Yeah, hi, Martha. Uh, thanks so much for coming and speaking with us. Uh, so we're living through uh, a period of rampant deregulation, and at the same time, more market forces seem to be consolidating power in really you know, small, tight areas. I'm just wondering, uh, so that seems like it forces the argument for those people that hold power to be moral. Um, do you think uh, capitalism and economics matches up with, with uh, morals? And can, can those two things work together? <laughs> and I thought the brain questions were tricky. I think I'd rather take one of those, please. Um, that's a big question, and I think it's really interesting coming at it from a European perspective, actually, because I think we have a slightly different take on that answer. I, I don't believe that Europe actually is full of rampant deregulation. I actually see marginally the opposite. You know, the, the EU has just tried to clamp down and fine Google. Germany is saying that it's going to fine social media companies if they don't take down extremist tweets within 24 hours, a significant amount, like 50 million euros, a big, a big number. So actually, I see slightly the opposite in our markets. And I do think that one of the interesting things will be how this plays out globally, because clearly, all these businesses are way more powerful than any one government. And that's going to be one of the huge challenges. You know, I've heard people talk about how could we build a framework, a global framework for regulating some of these businesses. What would that look like? Do we need to come together as we did after the war and build some conventions around some of this stuff? And I think those might be the things we have to, to challenge and build more, more actively. So, you know, I think capitalism, capitalism has been a mechanism that has lifted many billions out of poverty. It's clearly fueled, you know, economic growth around the globe. I don't believe in it unfettered. I believe in it in kind of socially responsible capitalism. And I think that's what we've marginally been more successful at in some areas of the world than others. What do you think? You don't get out of this. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, I think it's an excellent response. Um, <laughs> <laughs> You're a politician. You. <laughs> that guy's going to go He's far. He's a politician, I yeah. Like go ahead. Give him some money. <laughs> Uh, so thanks so much for coming to speak to us today. It's really okay. exciting to see someone in the legislature who doesn't believe, you know, the internet's a series of tubes. Um, <laughs> yep. Oh, well, very dangerous. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so my question is, uh, establishing morality requires establishing identity. And so how do you prevent that identity from being used not to stop, you know, kids from viewing pornography like they are in the UK, but yeah. instead to silence political opponents right. or incarceration, that kind of thing? I think this is one of the key questions, and I think we're kind of testing lots of different ways of doing it, right? So in the UK, I personally believe that the way we're going about some of this stuff is not going to work and wrong. You know, the, I think the game is over. I think the idea that you can tick a box that says, I'm 18, and here's my credit card details, I'm therefore going to be able to look at this porn, doesn't mean that eight-year-olds won't still try to find it. I'm sorry, but I think that's the game we're in. I think it needs to go back to how we educate, putting a different kind of response in to um, how teachers and children interact about this stuff, how parents and children interact about this stuff, building more of a different kind of etiquette around the internet. So I'm not sure I think that legislation is the right way to go about it, just to focus on the UK example. You know, again, if I go back to Twitter, this is really hard problem to unpick, and I wish I could tell you the smart things that I think will lead to better um, ways of doing it in the future. Because as you say, if you take away somebody's right to anonymity in a country where they're tweeting against a dictator, then you've done something very, very dangerous for that person. Whereas if you do it for somebody that might be trying to put horrible extremist stuff, then it's you know complicated thing. So I think that we are getting better at it. I think that more um, machine learning techniques and more manual interventions will improve some of the ways that we learn about people's identity. And I also think, as I think all of the platforms or social media networks would say themselves, we have been a bit slow about giving the tools to people to be able to say, actually, we don't want an anonymity from that person, but we do want it from this person. So I actually feel as though these are problems that will get easier to solve over time, not less easy. But the complexity to me is comes where governments and politicians think that there are easy tick boxes to some of this stuff because I don't think there are I'm just gonna go back to get the iPad because I can see a lot of questions on the app and I've got to be able okay. to scroll through it okay. but in the meantime why don't you ask your okay. question okay. one of the themes of this conference has been that collaboration is a good way to uh, stimulate innovation and working with your peers whether they also be in technology or in policy is a good way to solve bigger yeah. problems so would you share your experiences as both an entrepreneur and a policymaker um, as to 
what are the tools that we can best use to collaborate with our peers, take the first step to reach out to other people and say, what do you think about this? I think that's a very important challenge right now. You know, one of the things I perceive as um, something we really have to work hard to improve is this huge disconnect between the pace of innovation in people's lives, you know, in the services they can buy or use online, in the way that they can get, you know, the most incredible entertainment to any kind of device, at the speed with which they can connect with people all over the world, and then the way that policy happens and the people that have uh, been put in governments to do that policy making. There is still way too much disparity between the two. And joining that up has got to be a good thing, even if it just happens at moments or over projects or over a particular time. You know, I can just share one experience I had, which was, I think, one of the most fulfilling things that I've ever been a part of was I helped create a team in central government in the UK called the Government Digital Service. There'd never been a central team doing the kind of digital work across government, not the policy making, but the actual delivery of services to people. And guess what? Actually, I think in every country there are a bunch of technologists. I'm sure there are some in this room, engineers, technologists, who care deeply about public policy, care deeply about public service, want to improve the lives of citizens, don't just want to build another delivery app, and want to come and share some of those skills. So we've managed to find a lot of people who aren't going to work in government for 10 years, but might come for two or three years, who built our website, gov.uk, and then will go out and do in different things or morph back into their uh, previous lives. And I think that that's one route to improve globally the difference between people who work in government, people who make policy, people who deliver government services, and people who work in the digital world, to encourage much more of a kind of working, um, temporary working and um, building of services. So that's one thing. But I also think that um, it's important that leaders of countries recognize this. You know, it doesn't all start with the prime minister or the head of a department. But if they don't get it, then I don't think it's ever going to change. You know, if you have a founder who is a particular way, I personally believe that the company that grows up under them is very hard to move away from what they were like or the culture that they created. That's just how, it, how I've seen it again and again and again. The same is true. If you have a prime minister who doesn't really understand the importance of this stuff and doesn't filter it through to their departments or their governments or their civil service or however they run their country, I don't think it will ever change. So, that's quite good news, because there aren't actually that many leaders around the world. So if we can just get to them and encourage them to join this stuff up, then I think we can make quite big inroads. Thank you. Got a question here. Uh, it says, right now we're trying to fit women into a workforce that was for a long time mostly comprised of men, a point you made earlier. Rather than fitting women in, do you have any ideas for a way we can overhaul the work framework, yeah. uh, more than just maternity leave, et cetera, in a way that makes, uh, makes, it better at, uh, makes a better effort at involving and maintaining women's contributions? Yes, I think it's absolutely possible, and I'd like to give you a story of an amazing woman in the UK who I think if you want to look back to the future, she's a great place to start. She should be a real hero. I don't know how many people in this room have ever heard of Dame Stephanie Shirley, but um, she goes by her nickname, Stevie Shirley. She came to the UK on the kinder transport, you know, being taken out of Nazi Germany in the 30s to the UK, no family. She then became a original, literally, computer programmer when they were automating the machines in the um, 50s and 60s. And she started a business in the late 60s um, that was entirely women, entirely working from home, building the then type of software for government contracts. Not easy peasy projects, but black box for Concorde, Polaris submarine, amazing things. And the reason she's called Stevie is because when she was writing to get these contracts, she got all of the letters rejected when she wrote under her name Stephanie. But when she wrote Stevie, then she sometimes got in the door and then she'd go and she'd be a woman and then it was too late and she was clearly so impressive. But we... <laughs> by stealth, um, and we are lucky enough to become friends, and I have uh, lunch with her occasionally, and she's so fabulous, because she's just completely baffled. She says, how the hell can I have done that in the 70s, and now we don't have these innovative ways of enabling women to work, whether it's women coming back into the workforce after having children, or whether it's, you know, taking different kinds of um, working practices, to your point. So, why don't we look back, take some inspiration from some of the things that have gone in the past? Because now, with technology, those kinds of things should be even more possible than they were in right. the past. Over there. Hi. So I was wondering what you think the most effective way for young women in male-dominated industries to use social media to highlight the diversity and celebrate their accomplishments is? 
I also think is your hair pink? It is pink, <laughs> yeah. My hair is pink. It, um, good question. Easy question to answer. Um, it comes out for summer. Uh, I did it green once, but it just looked like I'd been dumped in seaweed. Um, <laughs> so I think that it can be such a great way of celebrating women if you can raise those voices on social media. And I, I think you should walk, use it as a campaign, you know, use your voice. I think that if you are a young woman in STEM, then just talk about the work you're doing. But don't just use social media. Use the kind of distributed networks. Write a blog and tweet your blog. Tell me and I'll tweet your blog. <laughs> tell other women, tell other men uh, to tweet what you're up to. And just use it as a real kind of campaign because it does take that much but, you know, really careful activity to get the word out there. But I think the great news is that there are a bunch of very receptive people who want to hear about great women in the industry. You know, it isn't filled with a whole load of monsters. In my experience, again, the technology industry is actually filled with some extraordinary people who want to hear from a diverse set of voices, but sometimes just don't know how to find them and where to find them. It's that classic network problem. So join groups, not just of men, but also, sorry, not just of women, but also with men and women. Tell them, you write blogs, write blogs for other people, People, get your stories out there because more than ever it's possible to do so. Should governments have access to security back doors to prevent crime or should the internet be fully independent and free? Government should not undermine encryption on the internet. Even for crime? I think there are other, we have legal ways of getting data from people. Let's use those existing legal ways. Some maybe marginally need to be updated about speed or pace or whatever. Right. You know, in the UK, it can take three months, I think, from signing in order to get access to data. But, but I don't believe we should. So, you're, in other words, you're saying no, uh, not an extrajudicial way of doing it. If the no, same no, same no, as any other evidence, no, if no. a court determines. Yeah. Because you undermine encryption for governments, then someone else will be able to undermine encryption yeah. for another um, less effective uh, purpose, and it's just wrong thing to do. Got it. Okay, right there. Um, so we've heard quite a lot about kind of engineers' responsibility for how the things that they create are used, yes. um, and potentially some ideas about or some sort of views saying that actually engineers aren't responsible, and actually it's politicians, people who use them, who actually should be thinking about that. Mm -hmm. um, I don't think that's true. I think engineers need to think about the responsibility for what they create. Um, how do you think? What do you think is the best way of encouraging that responsibility? Do you think it's through like legislation or do you think it's through a cultural change about how engineers think about what they create? I think it has to be a combination of things, don't you? I think one of the things I was interested talking about it yesterday, um, with a British engineer that I find interesting is that if you become a structural engineer, you have to do an ethics component to get your certification. One of the great challenges of the web and the design of the internet is that anyone, you know, I can start just building something and it doesn't really matter. It's no particular, um, I'm not required to have a certificate of anything, I, just as long as my code works, you know, it doesn't matter. And anybody that's read Kathy O'Neill's book, Weapons of Maths Destruction, I don't know how many people know her here or have read her book, but I would urge you to do so. She's a brilliant mathematician and she shows pretty categorically how, you know, this notion that code is non um, discriminatory or has, doesn't have biases in it is just such crap, it's unbelievable, that it does, and the people building it need to be aware of that and responsible for it in the same way that um, she would argue she saw happening before the financial crash, we need to be as aware of it. So I think that you're absolutely right, it is not one single thing. I think that um, we need to work out what the regulatory framework around some of these things might be, but that is somehow dealing with the end of the product, not the beginning of the product. So you need the cultural shift and you need the engineers themselves also to take responsibility. I don't think it's any one thing. I think it's like a cake and you have to get all the different bits of the pie right. I think we have a good question here. Clearly the lack of diversity is changing slowly. Do you think it would be more effective okay. if we work on changing the culture by working to develop more confidence and self-mastery in women at younger ages? It's not changing, just as an aside, it's completely plateauing. I think one of the most uh, depressing pictures I've seen, I mean, you know, in, in my world of digital, not, not macro in the whole world, is a chart of when men and women will reach parity in various different um, uh, sectors, areas. So McKinsey did this work, you may know it. So there's a chart and it says, you know, over the world, um, in I think it's 57 years, there'll be, mu there'll be parity in it's, politics. Yeah. And in, I think it was um, about 55, I can't remember the exact number, but in 74 years, there'll be parity in um, boardrooms. In digital and STEM subjects, never. It will never reach parity on current 
rates of uh, improvement because there is no rate of improvement because it's actually going marginally backwards at the same time as it is growing in importance to the global economies and global society. So it's not changing, just to call, okay. call out that. Um, now I've forgotten your question. The question <laughs> is, what's it got to do with uh, whether or not we need to develop oh, sorry, early confidence age. and yeah. self-mastery. Yeah. And the reason I, I yeah, asked no, the I question, the reason I chose this question, it's somebody else's question, yeah. but because it has come yes. up a couple of times about yeah. what should engineers do better to become great yeah. communicators. You're clearly a great communicator, so that question sort of fits yeah. into that category. I mean, I think, it's, I think it is important that we start at a very young age, but I don't think it's the whole answer. You know, as long as I've been thinking about this issue, it's always said, oh, education, education, education. And that is a piece, but it's not enough and it's not fast enough. And I also think it makes me feel as though it's beholden on women somehow to improve. If only women would improve and get more confident, then everything would be fine. But we all know it's much more complicated right. than that. There is an element of that. You know, I'm always struck by something that the CEO of the National Grid told me in a big engineering company, as you guys know. He did an appraisal system, and he thought it's very odd how in appraisals, I'm just not seeing the women doing as well as men. Men are getting promoted. I think it might be something to do with the way we're measuring them. And I still can't really believe this fact, but it's statistically significant that in a system where women are given four hard objectives and men are given four hard objectives, in an appraisal, women will say they have not achieved two of those, even if they've achieved them, and it's a number. Like, if they got 30 million of revenue, but they didn't think they got 30 million of revenue, this blows my mind. So there is clearly something to do with confidence and right. the way that women, you know, that's a thing. But I think it's not the only thing. And I think that if we can encourage young girls to be confident, and if we can encourage young girls to be tenacious, and we can encourage them to go into subjects that may feel as though they're dominated by men, that is good. But we also have to help men and systems understand why um, they may be closing out women from their networks. And that is not just about putting the onus on young girls. Okay. I'd like to start by thanking you to come talk to us, uh, uh, especially for the students in the audience, some of whom this is their first conference, may not realize that all of our speakers could not possibly accept a tenth of their invitations, and so it's wonderful to have you here. Uh, I, I wanted to mention that I have a lot more trust in Jack Dorsey, founder of Twitter, uh, not only because he's one of our former students of my university, but also uh, because I, uh, I trust both the, uh, the skill level, but also the agency problem compared mm -hmm. to a politician. Yep. And so particularly uh, if, you, if you look at what has happened in politics, not just domestically, but internationally, in the past couple of years, uh, most engineers, I think, are pretty skeptical about politicians. Yep. So I don't think I'm alone in this opinion. And, uh, and even in countries that do much better than the United States does as far as getting engineering expertise into politics. Uh, so, uh, for example, Hu Jintao was an engineer from one of the top engineering universities in China. My friend, I'm going to bring you on stage if you don't have a question. <laughs> but, uh, okay, real quick to wrap it up. Um, you see politicians do things like banning virtual private networks. Yeah. Uh, this, is, uh, this is dangerous. Yeah. And so uh, I, I want to mix it up a little there and say, hey, uh, do we really need more intervention of politicians because it wasn't that long ago where we were talking about whether it was Netscape or, or, know, or Microsoft. Right? Well, if this about. is a bid for me to get Jack to run for president, I'll try my best. But I can't, <laughs> yes, guarantee, I can't guarantee that. <laughs> but I think there's a bunch of things that I quickly want to respond there. But the main thing I'd say is you know, I believe very strongly that we need elected representatives to be technically literate, digitally literate. Not because it's the only thing, but because it is a fundamental underpinning of the decisions that they will be making about our future lives, about society. It's not about the technology. So I disagree with you in that I think we need to raise the bar. I'm not oh, saying yeah, that I think I, politicians yeah. should be wading in there. I think that's furiously dangerous, and I would cite lots of examples from Europe and the UK where we just have making bad decisions. But 
At the same time, I also get a real anxiety if we always assume that the entrepreneur, the person that has started a tech business, the things that suddenly seem to be much more dominant in our lives, are able to make better decisions than people who go into public service. I, I don't believe that's true either. I think we need much more sharing and collaboration between the two. I think we will see some strange and wonderful things happening. I mean, if Mark Zuckerberg isn't trying to put his bid for presidency out there, I don't know what the hell he's doing. So I believe that we will see some, you know, much more... Uh, uh, I, I, yeah, what am I trying to say? People from the tech sector who then want to go into politics. It feels inevitable. But I think that it's really important that we encourage good quality people from whatever background to become politicians and that we encourage them to understand the modern world from 2017, not the systems of 1817. Thank you. Uh, do we have a text box up there? All right. I see up in that corner a catch box. Fantastic. So apologies in advance uh, for the slightly doom and, goom, doom and gloom question. I can't see you. Well, you're kind of gloomy. Yes, I can't see you until where are you? Go, right way up there in uh, oh, hi. 2,000 feet out. <laughs> Got it. You see you. Hi. So uh, social media and the internet uh, are a wonderful thing. It's made the world a smaller place. But it does come with its side effects. So uh, I've spent some time as a teaching assistant in a school, and all of the children eight years younger than me all have mobile phones, all have iPhones, are all addicted to social media and struggle to concentrate in the classroom. Do you think we will ever see a point where the detriments of social media outweigh its benefits and do you believe we will ever see regulation of such, perhaps like a drug? I think this is very, very important and I do not want to sit here giving you the impression that I think social media can solve the world's ills and should be protected at all costs. I do not. I happen to love Twitter. I love its openness. I love the fact that it can speak truth to power. I love the fact that I personally use it for my work and have a bigger collective brain because of it than I could have done by myself. But there are many things that make me feel very alarmed. And as Twitter itself would say, you know, we have not dealt with abuse on the platform. You know, you only have to be a woman in any kind of public life and be on any kind of social media to know that these are hugely difficult and horrible places for a lot of the time. And children, in addition to that, are, as you say, kind of, we know now, addicted is exactly the right word. But to me, it is not too late to make much more conscious decisions about how we educate children, what we allow, what we use as parents, what we give children access to. I think part of this comes from a fear about um, as, you know, the generation of people who are now digitally native versus their parents who might not be, and the kind of lack of communication between the two. So I think it's really important. I'm not sure regulation enough is the right way of doing it or we'll get to the right root of the problem. I think it is a cultural shift we have to make and that's what I mean about you know the internet feeling like a teenager right now. We haven't worked out the etiquette. There's a lot of work going on. There's something that my friend Brent's chairing in the UK led by the um, Duke and Duchess of Cambridge which is looking at children's relationship to the internet and they've got the social media platforms to agree a kind of code of etiquette and the basic premise is don't do it on social media if you wouldn't do it IRL in real life. <laughs> And that, that, to me, you know, that's where you start. Would you say that to someone's face? And if you start to build that into children's lives and in the home, so in the home environment and in the school, then you can start to make shifts, I think. But I'm not naive about it. This is an enormous scale challenge, and we have to get on with it right now. IRL, we're almost out of time, but I think <laughs> I can take one more question. Actually, I'll yield to Philip. Thank you, Dr. Helms. <laughs> um, thank you for being here. Really appreciate your time. Um, quick question for a startup company entrepreneurship mindset here. Yep. What strategies did you use to pitch, value, and sell your company? <laughs> Another Good thing question. that was just with the question that we had a minute left for. Exactly. Um, <laughs> Simple you know, one. I think in, in my experience as a founder, but also someone that you know, still feels like I'm constantly raising money for whatever thing it might be, my charity or now businesses or whatever, it, Investors, to my mind, invest in people and ideas. So you have to have the two joined up together. You know, you have to be as credible as you can. You have to show you're already building what you want them to invest in. You have to show that you're already iterating it, that you would use it yourself, that you understand that user need. I think that, that that's the first thing. Don't underestimate that in my experience, uh, investors are investing in people. They often think the idea may change, morph, shift if that person is robust. So that's the most important thing. And the second thing is, it's relentless. You know, I feel this 
all the time people say to me, but I've said the same thing 50 times to investors. It's like, it doesn't matter, you have to say it 5,000 times. You know, when we were originally starting our business, lastminute.com, in 97, 98, no one believed that the internet was going to be somewhere where they would put their credit card details. That's how backwards the UK and Europe was at that point. We must have told 500,000 people again and again and again that this was something that was going to happen. So just have to keep spouting that message. So your own belief in it, your own credentials, those are the most important things, and I'm sure that you will be successful. Thank you. Well, that's all the time we have. Thank you so much, Martha Lane Fox. Thanks for having me. What an incredible conversation. What great energy. Thank you. Uh, thanks a million. Thanks to all of you. Uh, it's lunchtime now. Uh, you have your assignments, I believe, for lunch. Um, we're going to start at 1.50 p.m., so if you could all please be in your seats. We've got a very big session this afternoon, so please be in place uh, by the time we start. Have a great lunch. <laughs>